Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. One more outburst from you, Mr. Erickson, and I will hold you in contempt of court. The judge's face turned a bright shade of red, and I had to stifle a chuckle at her almost comic expression. Mr. Young, I strongly advise that you reign in your client. I had been warned a few times already, but it's hard not to say something when it's a staple of your vocabulary and you're dealing with someone like the judge. I once had a guy tell me that he'd never met anyone who said it more than I do. Maybe I do say it a lot, I have to admit it just flows without thought. Just as I started to speak, I saw the judge tense up, and my attorney, Mr. Young, who would soon be my partner in the law firm where he worked, warned me not to speak so openly towards the judge unless I wanted to spend a night in jail. The court records stifled a giggle, as I am sure they were bracing themselves for the torrent of expletives that were likely to fly from my mouth. On the other side of the courtroom, my ex-best friend, his wife, and my soon-to-be ex-wife sat nervously, looking around the room. Robin, my soon-to-be ex, looked ashamed and downtrodden. Bruce sat there with the feet on his face, and Cheryl, his wife, looked pissed off. She obviously didn't like all of their dirty laundry being aired in court. So by now, you might be wondering about the events that led up to me being admonished by the simpleton in the black robe about my conduct in her chamber, I mean courtroom. It all started one day, let's call it Tuesday because it was a Tuesday. My name is Jack Erickson. I am a 32-year-old foreman in the city maintenance department for the city of Stonemore, Colorado. I started with the city two days after I graduated high school. In winter, I plow the major thoroughfares. In summer, I do whatever needs to be done. Robin works a few hours a week at the church as a break from her housework. Our city maintenance department is split into four quadrants. Each quadrant has its own supervisor and a foreman. I am not that supervisor. I never went to college and used common sense, so I could never get the position. Also, I avoid having anyone's Johnny near my mouth. Another qualifier, usually, if a supervisor tells a crew to do something, they will ask someone like me before they waste their time. All of the foremen were promoted into their jobs while supervisors were directly hired. Monday evening brought one of those nasty June thunderstorms that produced a lot of high winds and hail. My quadrant got hit the hardest with wind and hail, so we had a lot of tree limbs and other debris to clear out of the streets. I had six crews going around with dump trucks picking up that stuff. I drove around in a pickup with a list of street flooding complaints. I checked each complaint area to see if storm drains were blocked with debris. If they were, I'd call out one of the two vacuum trucks I had at my disposal. I also had four street sweepers running all day long. In the afternoon, I surveyed problem alleys to see if we'd need to bring in gravel soon for them. None of my three parks got mowed. I'd have to get crews on that in the morning. My wife Robin and I had a nice four-bedroom, two-story home in an older neighborhood. We couldn't afford to live with the rich folk on the southwest side of town, but we didn't live in the east side gangland either. We got along fabulously with our neighbors. Tom and Jerry McBain lived next door. Ron and Cindy lived directly behind Robin and me, and my childhood friend Bruce Harris lived behind the McBains with his wife Cheryl. All four households got along so well that we had no fences separating our backyards. Bruce and I have been friends since we were in middle school. I got him into more trouble than he knew how to get out of, and to make matters worse, his parents were extra religious, while mine gave less than a damn about what God said. Dad often told me that as long as I didn't knock some girl up and cost him a bunch of money, he really didn't give a damn what I did most of the time. If Bruce's mom and dad were going to nail him for something, I'd tell them I did it, and he was mistakenly blamed. I know they hated me, so their opinion of me didn't really matter. Bruce grew up to be as religious as his parents, if not worse. He went to a Bible college and became a preacher. He is the pastor at one of the local churches. I don't go to church except for Easter and Christmas. Robin, on the other hand, goes to church religiously, pardon the pun. While Bruce was at college, he met Cheryl. Cheryl could have been a Playboy playmate. She is 5 feet 7 inches, 110 pounds, with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a 36D-24-34 figure. With all of that going on, she is a prayer machine. Bruce is like the E to my young, but there isn't a damn thing I wouldn't do for him, or so I thought. I got home on Tuesday evening to find that I had to warm up leftover meatloaf from Sunday for dinner. I didn't really mind doing that, 
but my wife hadn't actually cooked a weekday meal in a few months. I wanted to sit and enjoy a 12-pack, but the red mark on the calendar for that day told me I could have one beer with dinner and no more for the rest of the night. Red days were the days I was on emergency standby and could get called out at a moment's notice to handle some issue. I ate my dinner while Robin showered. I wish she'd spend as much time paying attention to my little Johnny as she did in the damn shower. It was 7 p.m., and I wasn't sure if I'd see her again that evening. I got half-assed how was your day when I got home, and that was about it. This had been going on for a couple of months, and I was getting a bit tired of it. The worst part was our intimate life. We used to get it on three, maybe four times a week. In the past three months, I had gotten Saturday night intimate twice, missionary only, and two half-assed tug jobs. She didn't even seem to notice me anymore, and that night was no exception. So I watched the Rockies play the Padres on TV and wished I could get my Jägermeister on. Around 10 o'clock, I was contemplating going to bed when my phone rang. I figured it would be Bruce whining about the Rockies' bats failing miserably or asking me to have my guys do something around his church, but it was the city-county dispatch calling to tell me about a water main break on the north side of town near the Birchwood Mall. I packed a few snacks in my lunch cooler and headed out the door. I almost went upstairs to tell Robin what was going on but decided, screw her. She didn't seem to give a damn anyway, so let her figure out on her own that I wasn't coming to bed. I got to the city yard and got the keys I needed while waiting for my crew, which was made up of guys from every quadrant that night, plus a supervisor from the city water department and four of their guys. I hooked a trailer up to the new Kenworth dump truck and loaded a Caterpillar backhoe onto it. By the time I was done loading, my crew was there, and we all headed for the place where we figured the break was. When we got there, it was obvious that the Northwest crews hadn't gotten to the storm sewers yet because the street was flooded. I sent a couple of guys back to get a vacuum truck. It was one o'clock in the morning before I pierced the pavement with the backhoe. With all of the water still on the street, it was slow going. By three o'clock, we had the pipe exposed and began hauling away the mud I had dug out of the hole. We would have fresh dry sand and gravel from the city gravel pit to fill the hole back in. At 8.45 a.m., the water guys had finally reconnected the pipe and tested their joint. The building inspector approved the fix around 9.30, and by noon, we were ready to repave the area. Since the paving would be handled by a separate contractor, I was able to get the equipment back to the yard by 1 o'clock. At 1.45, I was pulling into my driveway with the knowledge that I was off work until Friday. I unlocked the door and went inside. Robin didn't appear to be home. She was off doing whatever the hell it was that she did all day, which lately didn't seem to include housework. I went into the kitchen to grab a beer and a sandwich. I had just closed the fridge when I heard the unmistakable sound of a woman getting the pounding of her life. It seemed to be coming from upstairs. I listened for a moment and was pretty sure the sound was from upstairs. No wonder you don't screw me anymore, you filthy woman, I said to myself as I headed out of the kitchen. I opened the coat closet and pulled my Kimber Custom Crimson .45 from its hiding place and made my way up the stairs. The sound was louder upstairs. I could see the door to the master bedroom ajar, so I walked stealthily up to it. I jumped through the door and leveled the pistol at the bed. No one was there. I quickly checked the bathroom just off the bedroom, and it too was deserted. Back in the hall, I was left with two choices. The guest bedroom door was closed, at least she respected our marriage bed, I thought to myself. I opened the door and once again leveled the pistol at an empty room. The only room I hadn't explored was Robin's craft room. I pictured her bent over her sewing table with the meat flying in and out of her tunnel. I kicked the door open and jumped into the room, ready to kill. The room was empty, but the sound was loud in there. When I noticed the window overlooking the backyard was open, I looked out to see if there was anything unusual happening. I saw that I needed to mow my grass, but no one was in the yard. As I scanned the yards around my house, I was shocked by what I saw. Tom and Jerry have a pool? I looked over and saw Tommy and Brenda, the McBain children, engaged in an intimate moment on a chaise lounge by their pool. Tommy was a junior in college, and Brenda was about to start her freshman year in the fall. Brenda had always had a crush on me since she was young, and I absurdly wondered if she was thinking of me at that moment. Neither of them was particularly noteworthy in appearance, but Brenda had a remarkable physique. 
I found it disturbing to witness such a private and inappropriate display. It made me think, this only happens in places like Mississippi. I knew I shouldn't be watching, but I couldn't look away. I wondered if Tom or Jerry had any idea about this happening in their home. I doubted it. They weren't as straight-laced as Bruce and Cheryl, but even the wildest people I knew wouldn't condone such behavior. I bet they're watching us, Brenda said. Look at them, Tommy replied. Oh, that's so intense, Brenda commented. She looked to her left, and I followed her gaze. I could see Bruce's bare back in the upstairs window of his house. He was clearly with Cheryl. I thought I'd stay for a few minutes, it might be my only chance to see Cheryl naked. Then Bruce and Cheryl turned around. Wow! I exclaimed loudly, causing the activity in the yard below to abruptly stop. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Bruce was with someone I knew well. I froze, unsure of what to do. I raised my pistol and took aim at Bruce. Movement below caught my attention just in time. Tommy and Brenda were running towards their house. I looked back up, intending to confront Bruce, only to find that they had left the window. Damn it! I yelled as I went down the stairs. I stopped in my den long enough to grab my Mossberg bullpup and load it with buckshot. Bruce was going to pay for what he had done. The 304 was going to pay too. I was ready to confront Bruce and make him answer for his actions. I tucked the pistol into the waistband of my jeans and headed out the door. I stopped halfway down my driveway and stood there, realizing many things. I understood why my house was in disarray, why my meals came from the freezer, and why my little Johnny was neglected. I knew why the 304 took so many showers that it seemed like they were named after me. I walked back up my driveway and got into my truck. I backed out and left tire marks on the street as I headed for Lowe's. On the way, I contemplated everything I knew now. She never cooked anymore because Bruce was wearing her out. She couldn't keep up with household chores either. The biggest question I had was why the two people in the world I was supposed to count on the most had betrayed me so deeply. I was on autopilot. I got to Lowe's and went directly to the door section and picked up three new lock sets. Jeannie at the paint counter waved at me, and I almost didn't notice. I half-heartedly waved back. When I got home, Brenda and Tommy were waiting in my driveway. What do these people want? I asked myself. They looked as if they were bracing themselves for something. Brenda offered me a sheepish smile. We're sorry to have disturbed you, Mr. Erickson. We didn't mean to offend you. It's just... I cut her off. Look, I don't care what you two do. It's none of my business. You guys aren't even on my radar of problems right now. They turned sheepishly and walked toward their own house. I felt Brenda's gaze follow me as I walked into my house. I set the lock sets down and went to find my tools. As I approached the kitchen, I felt my anger rise. There, sitting at my table, was Bruce. What are you doing in my house? I came to talk to you as a friend. Friend? I laughed bitterly. With friends like you, who needs enemies? Do you think I'm just going to pretend everything is fine? Jack, it doesn't have to be this way. Bruce, just get out of here. I slid a knife across the table to him. He looked at it and then at the Kimber in my hand. Come on, Jack, he said a bit shakily. You can't seriously expect. Pick it up. If you care so much about your so-called morals, let's see how much you really believe in them. Bruce jumped up and ran for the door. He stopped on the porch and turned back. Jack, we've been friends forever. Are you willing to throw that away? I lost two people dear to me today. But I think when I get past all of it, I'll realize it really isn't a loss. Where's Robin? She's at my house. She's afraid to come over here. You tell her she has five minutes to get here if she wants even the slightest chance of staying married to me. Now get off my property before I do something I'll regret. Bruce scurried off, and I wondered how long it would take Robin to come home. A few minutes later, I heard her crying long before I saw her. I bet people wondered what was going on when they saw Robin walking up the sidewalk, sobbing. She reached to hug me and I took a step back. Please, keep your distance. But I love you, baby. There's no one I want to spend my life with but you. Let's go inside. 
We don't need to air our problems. I went into the living room and sat in my favorite chair. She sat on the love seat and asked, Would you sit here next to me? No, I don't want to be near you. I've never liked uncomfortable silences, so I jumped right in. So, how long have you been seeing Bruce? He loves you like a brother. He's your best friend. Bruce was my friend. Friends don't betray each other like this. It's just intimate. What a load of crap. Whoever thought of that excuse needs to have their head caved in with cinder blocks. I yelled. There's no need to be angry. You still have me. I'm not going anywhere. You aren't. You're choosing Bruce over me and our marriage. You can't give me five minutes of your time anymore, but you can bend over for him at the drop of a hat. How wonderful. I felt a headache coming on and put my head in my hands. She started getting up and walking toward me. Sit your butt back down. I hope it is worth a decade of marriage that you're tossing aside, babe. I'm not tossing our marriage out. We can stay married. I'll just have intimate with Bruce. I don't love him, just as meat. He says I can come take care of your needs once or twice a week. Well, isn't that mighty kind of him? I think I'll just find myself someone else to take care of my needs. No, you're my husband, and no one needs to have intimate with you except for me. We are still man and wife. Not much longer at this pace. Ex-wife is more fitting for a woman who drops her pants for a hypocritical scum sucker like Bruce Harris. No, please don't talk like that. I love you with all my heart, but I love Bruce's big meat too. You just need to understand. Bruce has it all planned out. We can all be happy. Oh, I understand perfectly. You wish to have your cake and eat it too. It's not like that at all. Then explain it to me, damn it. I can't. You'd never. Well, um, I think Bruce wants me back in three minutes. What the hell are you babbling about, you idiot? She looked like I had slapped her. You've never called me names. You've never talked this way to me. What's gotten into you? Oh, let's see. What might have me a tad bit on edge? It might have something to do with the fact that I haven't slept since 6 a.m. yesterday morning and I worked all damn night. Or it might just be that I got home to find my wife drilling a guy who wasn't me. You stupid, sucking idiot. She was crying and headed for the door. That's it, you filthy woman. Go to Bruce. Go get some of the thick meat your holes crave. She turned around at the door. I don't see why we can't keep things like they are right now. It's not like you were home all the time. I can be as while you were at work, and four or five nights. I slammed the door so hard I thought it splintered. Screw you. Go eat your cake. I yelled so loudly that my throat hurt for half an hour afterward. I sat with my back to the door for a while, doing something that made me feel quite unmanly. Dad would have whipped my butt if he'd seen me with tears, so I sucked it up and got on with my tasks. I changed the lock sets on all of my doors and recoded the garage door opener. At four, I decided to take a break. I was dragging but needed to sit. I flipped on the TV and tuned into Jerry Springer. How fitting, today, a show about cheating wives and messed up families. I didn't make it very far with Jerry as exhaustion took me. When I woke up, it was well past nine, and someone was knocking at my door. I got out of my chair and went to the door. It was Bruce. What the hell do you want, asshole? I ought to beat the ever-loving crap out of you for being on my porch. I need a favor from you, man. Well, if you don't take the cake. I don't have a girlfriend yet for you to screw, shithead. Try elsewhere. Robin needs you. She's over there bawling her eyes out. Can't you call her and tell her that you're not angry and that everything will be alright? I tell you what, she loves your meat so much, have it. Tell her everything will be okay. I'm done with both of you. What's she going to say when she finds out you're screwing Robin? She knows. She's happy, you know, so the sneaking around can stop. She wants you two to stay together, though. Get your sick, perverted butt off my porch. Tell that 304 that her whore ass will be on the porch in the morning so she can get it. Any door knocking will be met unkindly. I slammed the door again and went to find a cold beer. 
I'm still not sure why I did it, but I took my cold six-pack upstairs and sat in Robin's craft room, watching out the window. Soon, it dawned on me, I should have the video camera to collect evidence for divorcing the woman. I went and got the camcorder. As I sat watching the back of Bruce's house for activity, movement next door caught my eye. Jerry McBain was out at the pool. She was wearing a robe, and I hoped the hell it stayed on, or barring that, she was wearing a one-piece bathing suit underneath it. Jerry might be the nicest person in the world, but damn, she fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. Unlike her daughter, her body wasn't a pleasing distraction from her face. Tom isn't much better, so it baffles me that Tommy and Brenda are only unpleasant to look at and not downright fugly. There must be some recessive genes that work there. Well, God just wasn't smiling on me that day. Jerry removed her robe and dove into the pool. I turned my attention back to Bruce's house. With the camera on night vision, I could see Cheryl and Robin sitting on their back porch swing. They weren't talking loud enough to hear, so I didn't bother trying to record them. I saw headlights splash across the back of Bruce's house and knew Tom must be home. He manages a restaurant and works late most nights. He went straight to the pool and started stripping. What the hell did I do to deserve this? I asked myself. I watched Bruce until I heard the splash of Tom entering the pool. They cozied up, embraced, and treaded water. I could hear their conversation perfectly. How was work, babe? Busy as hell. I had to fire one for smoking weed on his break. You warned him. I heard something interesting today. Oh, do tell. Jack kicked Robin out today. What? Really? Yeah, he actually kicked her out today. Has he lost it? Those two would die without each other. I always figured she'd throw him out for his foul mouth. You have to be wrong. According to Tommy and Brenda, when they were cleaning the pool, they saw Bruce and Robin in Bruce's window having intimate. I guess Jack must have been at home for some reason. They heard Jack holler a profanity and saw Bruce and Robin quickly stop their activity. They said Jack left the house, came back with a Lowe's bag, and changed the locks on the house. Later, Robin came over, and when she left, he slammed the door and called her a whore. I can't believe it, said Tom. I'll have to see Jack tomorrow and make sure he's okay. I'd like for you to stay away from Bruce. I always thought he looked at you and Robin a lot closer than he should have. I shuddered at the thought of Bruce mentally undressing Jerry. Sick. Brenda said she was going to take him a cake tomorrow to cheer him up. She's always thought highly of Jack. He's crude as hell, but I can't think of anyone else I'd want on my side. I saw him this morning working on a street by the mall. Was he wearing a hard hat? Yes. You and your construction worker fetish. Maybe I can get Jack to model it for you. I shuddered again. Normally, a guy loves to hear that a member of the fair intimate finds him attractive, but for the first few weeks that we lived next to Tom and Jerry, I thought they were a gay couple. Jerry can look quite manly. You're so bad, she told him. I can't for the life of me figure out why Robin would rather screw Bruce when she has Jack at home. You're starting to make me get a complex, you know. You're the only hunk for me, my sexy man. When I realized that something was happening that I didn't want to think about, I decided to go to bed. I wasn't sure I'd sleep, but I turned on the radio for some noise and found the heavy metal grindcore show on the college station. I lay there listening to intense tracks by Carcass, Deicide, and Obituary. Just before the show ended, they played Cannibal Corpses Make Them Suffer. As I listened to the song, I felt a strong desire for retribution. With Corpse Grinder's voice echoing the refrain Make Them Suffer, I said to myself, I will, Corpse Grinder, I will. I was awakened the next morning by someone pounding on my door. I shook off the last vestiges of sleep and went down to see who had an early morning death wish. I opened the door, ready to yell at Robin for disturbing me, only to find Cheryl Harris. Oh, it's you. What the hell do you want? Robin's stuff isn't packed just yet. I don't want you to pack her stuff, Jack. I want you to let her come back home. And here I thought you were going to ask for something unreasonable. I'm going back to bed. I started to close the door, and she put her hand in the way. Wait, Jack. Why are you doing this? 
Robin is hurting for you, and you won't consider her feelings. What's to consider? She wants to be with you and Bruce more than she does with me. I'm allowing her to be with you too, and I am staying out of the way. Bruce and I can't have her live with us. We have an image we have to protect. You perverts should have thought of that before you pulled my wife into your sick game. Why can't she live with you? Really? You don't see a problem here? I gave her a chance to stay. She chose your husband's meat over me. The most screwed up thing about it is that you don't seem to have a problem with it, but I do. Now leave me the hell alone, will you? She still loves you, Jack. We didn't want to take her away from you. We love her and you as well. I hate to see you throw your friendship with Bruce away. He's dead to me. So is she. You can't mean that. Back. She will still take care of your needs. Oh, why didn't you say so sooner? I feed and board her, buy her clothes, car, and everything she needs. She continues to screw you too, and I get tossed off once a week. Bruce gets his fun and doesn't have to pay for upkeep. Screw that. Do I get intimate time with you? Sorry, Jack, I am a one-man woman. A one-man woman? I said bemusedly. Man, I'd sure like one of those. Well then, that's what I have to go find. Tell the horror stuff will be out here in an hour or so. Come on, Jack, stop acting like a caveman and join the modern age. Bruce and I have an image to keep up for our church. We can't have Robin living with us. Well, it sounds like you have a dilemma. Sucks to be you. I slammed the door and went to make some bacon. Screw their image, I said to myself. I can't believe anyone thought I'd go for this stupid idea. They want to appear squeaky clean while having wild intimate with my wife. Corpse Grinder's words came back to me, make them suffer. I called a guy I worked with and asked him who had handled his divorce. He walked away with almost all of his hard-earned assets when he caught his wife sleeping with her brother. Hmm, that inbreeding thing seemed to be prevalent. He gave me the name of the law firm, it seemed that Crosby, Stills, and Nash specialized in representing men who didn't want to get royally screwed over in their divorces. I called and got an appointment that afternoon for a face-to-face -face with one of their best. Then I packed all of Robin's clothes and toiletries into bags and put them on the front porch. I boxed up a lot of the things I knew she'd want and added those to the pile. Finally, I put her car keys under the floor mat and went to the bank. At the bank, I cancelled all of the credit cards, closed my bank account, and reopened one in my name only. She had a card in her name that I didn't know about until then. I gave them Bruce's address so they could send him the bill. At one o'clock in the afternoon, I went to the law office. I had heard that David Crosby had a reputation for making quick work of any divorce attorney. Those he couldn't easily beat, he hired the secretary instead. I was shown into the office of Burt Young. He was a scruffy guy, but his record spoke for itself. He sat there and didn't say a word as he looked over the files I had brought in. Then he called his paralegal in, told her something, and the girl left with my paperwork. Mr. Erickson, I think we can get you everything you want and take the preacher down a notch or two. Do you have photo or video proof? No, but the neighbor kids saw them too. I just want her out of my life. I don't care what she does after that. The paralegal brought in a bunch of papers, and I started signing. Bird explained what each one was and why it was necessary. Then he gave me a list of things I needed to do. I had already done a few of them. I gave him his retainer and went home to nap. Robin's stuff was gone when I got home. There was a note taped to my door. I took it inside and lay down on the couch. Springer was on. The note was from Robin, imploring me to allow her to come home. No mention of giving up Bruce's fun. Bert and I had decided to serve her and Bruce with legal papers at church on Sunday. I got a kick out of the idea and decided I'd attend. There were over 50 messages on my answering machine connected to my landline. All deleted in one fell swoop. With the aid of beer, I was able to sleep well that night. When I went to work the next morning, I set to fixing Bruce's wagon. First, I called up the city accounting department. I had allowed my crews to haul several loads of gravel to Bruce's church for nothing. I had kept the tear slips, and now I knew why. 
Janice assured me the bill would be entered as late or unpaid, so Bruce would be getting a call from the collection department. At $45 a ton, plus another $30 for transportation costs, Bruce now owed the city $7,500 for gravel and would be getting a visit from the building inspectors since he never pulled permits for the work. I also wondered out loud in front of the water company supervisor if they had a compliant water meter. I knew they had an older residential model and would have to cough up $1,200 to replace it. Bruce knew I kept them from paying the piper on a lot of things. Make them suffer. I was going to bankrupt the prick. I also knew of several home projects Bruce hadn't done properly. Building inspectors now knew of those. Bruce would pay out of the nose to get it all straight. I knew he'd call in a while, pissed off. I told my supervisor what I was doing with the tear sheets. Just as I knew he would, Bruce called at noon. What are you trying to pull, Jack? What do you mean? You know what I mean. Building inspectors telling me I have to undo the whole parking lot. You said everything would be fine. Well, it seems I forgot to turn in a bunch of paperwork, but don't worry. I'll be reprimanded. I hope they fire you. My supervisor came in just then. He knew who was on the phone. Jack, about that late paperwork, remind me to put a scathing post-it note in your file. I'll have to get a post-it note to remind me to remind you. Okay, Jack, try not to do it again. Oh, that was some reprimand, Jack said. Bruce, I'm surprised he didn't find you a nickel. He did file all of my tear slips. Bruce should be expecting a bill. He hung up rudely. The rest of the day passed normally, and I ended up at Mob's Bar that evening for a beer, or quite a few. City workers and cops frequented Mob's, and by 11, many of them had heard my story, either from me or from one of the several who had heard it earlier. A full-out campaign of harassment was underway. One guy on the police force mentioned that Bruce might get pulled over more often now. My new fishing buddy from the fire department decided that the church might make the inspection list on Monday, and the fire marshal would give it his full attention. These churches are always out of date on something, he said. We usually don't enforce the code too harshly with them, but I think Tony will feel that the safety of the congregation and the church's neighbors might be worth considering. Sheila Torres, a secretary for the county clerk's office, mentioned that the assessor might discover an error on Bruce's property tax assessment for last year and a past due amount might have to be dealt with. Make them suffer, indeed. Saturday morning, I was working in my garage. I had tried to work in my backyard, but between the half-naked genetic misfortunes next door and the swinging a-holes behind them, my backyard was anything but a haven. I was cleaning up a cabinet I was restoring when I heard a furtive noise behind me. These chicks just never learn, do they? I thought. I could literally feel eyes boring into my back. I just knew it had to be Robin. I spun around to tell the trash-eating scumbag to hit the bricks, only to lock eyes with Brenda. Um, hi Jack, or I mean Mr. Erickson. Hi, what do you need, Brenda? Looking at her, I thought whoever coined the term Butterface was definitely gazing upon Brenda McBain when he did. She definitely had a body to die for, and at the moment, she wasn't covering much with her bikini. I could feel my Johnny involuntarily rising, but thinking of her extracurricular activities with her brother killed it. I have a video you might find useful, Mr. Erickson. I took it a week ago. She handed me a USB stick and allowed her hand to linger in contact with mine. Meanwhile, my eyes locked onto her chest. I looked at her face again to control myself and saw undeniable lust in her eyes. She blinked, and it was gone. Um, I have chores I have to do, but I thought the video on there might help you in your case, Mr. Erickson. I'll look at it as soon as I can. Brenda, thank you for bringing it. She turned around and headed for the door, looking back over her shoulder. I saw something in her face, but couldn't place the look. It's my pleasure to be of assistance, Jack. Have a good one. She had never openly called me anything other than Mr. Erickson. I put the memory stick in my pocket and continued with my tasks. I finally got my lawn mowed and only had to endure Robin screaming and wailing from Bruce's balcony for most of it. I put buying a loud MP3 player on my to-do list. I kept hoping Tom and Jerry would call the cops, but to no avail. The whole family abandoned their pool and opted for the AC in their home. Around 5, 
I decided to head over to Joe's Pit Barbecue for their famous melt-in-your-mouth rib platter. As I was eating, John Brandon, Cheryl's brother, came in and spotted me. John was an engineer for the city-slash-county road and street department. He and I had worked together many times and had a good rapport. I wasn't sure what to expect from John, so I pretended not to notice him. He told Ramona, Joe's wife and longest-standing employee, that he had a to-go order and paid. She told him it would be a few moments, and I thought I was home free. Next thing I know, John is by my table. Hi, Jack. I haven't seen you in ages. John. I've been pretty busy. Seems every time we get one storm cleaned up and dealt with, another two roll through. Yeah, I hear that. We're going to open bidding next week for replacing the Johnson Street Bridge. You guys will get some of the tasks for that, but the commissioners want it to be mainly contractor work to keep public crews freed up for other projects. That sure would be nice. We need to get at least 100 potholes filled and three park irrigation systems repaired. So, how's life treating you? I couldn't tell if he was fishing for information or if he didn't know anything yet. We made small talk for a few minutes, and then he said, I understand the drainage at my brother-in-law's church has come under scrutiny, and he'll be paying some large dollars to the city for the upgrades. I'm glad someone is finally stepping on that dirtbag's toes. Remind me never to get on your bad side, Jack. He clapped me on the shoulder. See you around, Jack. He went and got his food and left. I finished my meal and left, stopping at Chang's Liquor to buy a bottle of vodka before heading home. I was just about to sit in front of the TV when I remembered the USB stick that Brenda had given me earlier. I popped it into the port on my laptop and opened it. I saw only one file and opened it. I was treated to a shot of Brenda leaning out of her bedroom window. She wasn't wearing anything below the waist and seemed to be focused on herself. I watched for a moment and realized she was saying something, Oh babe, I hope you know how much you turned me on. I recognized the sound of my lawnmower coming in through the open window and remembered that she had watched me most several times. On the screen, she was clearly very involved. I was about to fast forward to see if there was anything relevant when Tommy walked into the room. Hold it right there. Are you Jack Tubba? I felt a pang of embarrassment, knowing that I was a frequent topic in the McBain household. I am Tommy. Pretend you're him. Will you help me understand what's going on here? I started scrolling through the video. After a moment, I saw what had prompted Brenda to give me this video. I wished she had removed the more explicit parts, but I suppose she wanted me to see it all. Tommy had stopped filming and grabbed the camera. The screen then showed Robin, Bruce, and Cheryl together on their terrace. I felt a mix of anger and foolishness for how close this had all happened to me. I knew I now had something I could use in my divorce. I made a call to someone who owed me a favor. The video would serve another purpose before it ever reached court. For the first time in ages, I was up early on Sunday morning and ready for church. I had my coffee and bagel and read the news. At 20 minutes till 11, I drove to the Vinewood Presbyterian Church. In the parking lot, I saw a few others who, like me, probably didn't attend Bruce's services regularly. I followed them in and took a seat in the third pew. I caught the eye of Robert Donovan, who ran the audiovisual system for the services and owed me a favor. I checked the bulletin to see when I'd have my moment. It would be after the offering plates were passed, which would work perfectly. The choir entered, and Cheryl and Robin walked in close together. I wondered if any of the blue-haired old bags had any clue what the minister's wife in the first alto had been up to the night before. Bruce came out and began babbling about forgiveness being most important in the eyes of God. I almost thought that he knew I was in the audience. I didn't once hear the seventh commandment mentioned, though. We sang a few tunes about Jesus, and then the plates were passed around. I knew that when the plates were gathered, they were delivered to Robert at the audio-video console. He would count the money during the sermon, and the church secretary would deposit the money on her way home from services. About ten minutes after the offering, we reached the part one had been waiting for. Bruce said a prayer welcoming all newcomers into the house of God. Then he asked that all of the guests attending please come forward and introduce themselves. My three guests all stood from their various positions around the congregation and went to the pulpit. 
The little kid next to me started to tell me to go, but his mom stifled him instantly with a pop to the back of the head. I had to chuckle. Bruce shook hands with each and asked them to introduce themselves. A young brunette spoke first. I am here to see Cheryl Harris. Cheryl, looking puzzled, came forward as the brunette handed the mic to a pimply-faced red-haired kid. I'm here to see Robin Erickson, he said. Robin came down and joined Cheryl in front of the three. The pimply-faced kids handed the mic to their boss's son, Neil Young. Bruce Harris, Cheryl Harris, and Robin Erickson, you have all been served with. With that, the three simultaneously pushed documents into the astonished lover's hands. At that point, Bruce got his microphone back and asked, Why have you defiled my sanctuary this way? As if on cue, Robert streamed the video clip that I had carefully edited to protect my disgusting neighbors onto the big projection screen behind the pulpit. The image of Bruce, Cheryl, and Robin riding naked around the patio was larger than life in front of the congregation. I saw four or five old biddies reaching for their jitterbugs, and I knew the cops would be here soon. One old lady approached Bruce and racked his nuts with her cane. At some point during the melee, Robin read her paper and let loose a blood-curdling scream. I was headed for the door and turned to see who was slaughtering her. Unfortunately, both she and Bruce saw me, and she came running. Bruce couldn't have run if the Nazis had been coming to toss him into an oven. I spun for the door only to be met by a cop who must have been at the donut shop across the street. Days later, after all of the dust had settled and the DA had refused to file charges against me, Bruce had the privacy fence installed that his restraining order against me required. Sure, I wasn't allowed anywhere near his church except on city business, but he wasn't allowed to harass me either. Even better, Robin was included in the order and only allowed to contact me through Bert. Young Sonny Bono, our assistant DA, had even chuckled a bit when I told him how I had slipped the USB stick into the collection plate for Robert to find. Bruce had been screaming for me to be charged with trespassing, but since it was a public service, he didn't get far with his complaints. Robert was relieved of his duties, but because Bruce didn't want any more publicity, he didn't say a word when Robert took a job at the Presbyterian Church across town. Bert Young called me two days later to inform me that we'd go before the Honorable Sonia Kagan in two weeks to begin proceedings. She can be a real ball buster, she tends to give the wife more leeway than the husband, but since you already own the house, there aren't too many ways she can screw you over. She always gives alimony to cheaters, though, which makes me a bit nervous. My immediate supervisor is a kid just out of college. I pretty much call the shots in my quad since he never overrides me, he knows I know the ropes and leaves it at that. The supervisors of the other two quads are easygoing but don't let their foreman have as much control. However, they get out there and work with their crews. It's best if my supervisor stays in his office. Marvin Taylor, the supervisor for the worst quad in town, neither gives his leads any rain nor helps his crews. Marvin is one of those guys you just walk the other way from if you see him coming. Dick is probably the best term for him. Most guys say they'd rather pull their ball hair out with pliers than spend five minutes talking to Marvin. Most of us believe he caught some member of the city council in a compromising situation or he was the mayor's lover, and that's how he's managed to keep his job this long. Luckily, I rarely saw Marvin. Every once in a while, he'd actually see me in my office when he had nothing going on and stop in. Today, he obviously had nothing pressing and graced me with his presence. I knew that if he managed to have a five-minute conversation without saying anything racist or sexist, it would snow tomorrow, even though the 4th of July was only a week away. So, Jackie boy, I hear tell that you're getting a divorce. What happened? She catch you with your schlong in the cat's poop shoot? I wasn't about to tell him the truth. No, I just got tired of her. Do you have a judge yet? Yeah, Judge Kagan is hearing the case. That horrifying witch. She screwed my boy royally in his divorce. Gave that brother-loving 304 he married the house and the kids, and Jeff has to pay for both. I hope you have a good attorney, Jack. Jeff went in with some kid he found in the free ads. I wondered if Marvin ever thought about the Hagee spewed. He managed to defile two races in one fell swoop. I wondered if he ever talked this way in front of Jimmy Raines. Jimmy was Marvin's foreman, 6 feet 5 inches and 240 pounds, an African-American who had played linebacker for the New York Giants. 
On the surface, he appeared as if he would kill you for looking at him. However, I learned that after a beer or two, Jimmy was a riot. One evening, we were at Mobs and had been drinking for at least three hours. Each time one of a group of five frat boys would approach the bathroom, Jimmy would get up and haul in there, eyeballing the frat boys all the way. They finally left without ever going to the head. Jimmy thought it was hilarious. Zeke, the bartender, who was 6 feet 5 inches and 320 pounds, politely asked Jimmy to stop screwing with the college kids and told us that our next picture was on him. Jimmy was a great guy, but I have my doubts he'd find humor in Marvin's rampant use of the N-word. It was Jimmy who saved me from Marvin's further harassment by appearing and telling him that they needed to get out to the site where his most inept crew was. Once guys realized what a jerk-off Marvin was, they either transferred or quit. As Marvin and Jimmy moved on down the hall, I said a quiet prayer of thanks for Jimmy and his timely appearance. In two weeks, I'd be in front of that horrifying judge, and I doubted Jimmy could put in an appearance and get me out of that one. But hey, I thought to myself, maybe it won't be all that bad. What the hell kind of stupid commie pinko is this on the bench in her black robe? Judge Sonia Kagan sat unflinchingly as a torrent of filth erupted from me. This stupid which had actually ordered my soon-to-be ex-wife's request for couples counseling to be undertaken. When I stated I wouldn't go, she threatened me with jail. I turned to Bert and said, Come on, you gotta tell this witch that the therapy isn't flying. I looked at the judge and said, I just want to be rid of this skanky hole and her preacher intimate pals. Bruce hung his head as if he wanted to disappear. Cheryl was pissed off and if looks could kill, I'd have been on my way to St. Peter long before that particular speech. Burr had subpoenaed the Harises as material witnesses. They had fought it, only to be threatened with a failure to appear charge if they didn't show. Their congregation had already dwindled to the point that Bruce's two Sunday services for 150 or so parishioners had become one service for 10, who either couldn't find another church or just wanted to see if an orgy might occur. Three representatives from the main church in Denver were planning to get a new parson to replace Bruce. The once proud choir of 20 was now just Cheryl, Robin, and old Charles Brown. First and foremost, it's only said X. I wondered if she'd buy that excuse from me if I'd been caught with my pickle in Rebecca Sanders' pickle jar. Becky was Robin's best friend in college. The night that Robin dumped Jim Smith for me, Becky hooked up with him. From that point on, Becky has been known as the 304 of all 304s. Jack works a lot of hours sometimes, and I feel opening my list of cheaters is excuse numero dos. Feeling neglected or unromanced, I don't know what the deal is. My hours were from 7 a.m. till 4 p.m., Monday through Friday. I had only been called away at night four times in the past year and a half. My first time with Bruce was all about curiosity. I had heard that Bruce had a larger than normal, ah, well, you get the point. Curiosity, how many worthless scum dumpsters over the ages have used the excuse of wanting to know what a bigger piece felt like or how intimate with a different man was, as an excuse to go grab some non-husband schlong? As she went on about that, I recalled exactly how I had hooked up with her. Homecoming meant more to Southern Colorado State than it did to others. Others went and supported the team no matter how badly they got creamed. Most of us just knew that the parties were going to be outrageous. Willie Barnes' bonfire and drunken fest on the eastern prairie was no different than any other bash around town. Willie was 45 years old but held the bash on his uncle's ranch every homecoming without fail. The old pervert got off on the possibility of college and high school girls shedding their clothes and him getting to roam about and watch. Willie got arrested five years later when six girls complained that he had assaulted them and charges stuck for three of them. Homecoming during Robin's junior year was truly special as the fighting farmers actually won their game. Now, half of the opposing team had stomach flu, but SCS won, and that was all that mattered. I wasn't a student, I worked for a living and hoped one day to afford some classes. I worked part-time for the city and part-time as campus maintenance. Since the team won, we were told we didn't have to clean up until Sunday morning, so we could party and only clean the place up once instead of twice. My friend Jerry Barnes, Willie's cousin, invited me to the big event at the ranch that evening. By 11 o'clock, I was fairly buzzed. About half of the crowd had disappeared, though the parking lot still had plenty of cars. A few seemed occupied, but most were empty. 
since the barn and other buildings were likely full of people in the pastures too. I figured it was safe to use the parking lot as a restroom. I walked out and stopped in front of an empty car, then proceeded to relieve myself on the grill and front bumper. As I was finishing up and putting myself away, I stumbled and bumped into the car. To catch myself, I placed my hands on the hood, and the headlights came on, shining directly on me. I quickly pulled myself together, muttering, oops, sorry, and headed back to the bonfire. I had just opened another beer when I noticed the same woman from the parking lot approaching. To avoid drawing attention to myself, I moved to the other side of the fire. As I passed a group of frat boys who knew me, they all greeted me warmly, though only one of them actually knew me well. As the guys were doing their friendly thing, I felt a hand brush my hips and turned to see the woman walking away, wondering what had just happened. The next morning, as I was dressing for work, I got my wallet out of the jeans I had worn to the party and felt something in the other hip pocket. I pulled it out and saw that it was a note, if you liked what you saw as much as I liked what I saw, call me at your earliest convenience. Robin's name and a phone number were written at the bottom. I spent most of the day cleaning up debris from the celebratory students and wondering if the note was genuine. During my final break, I decided to give the number a call. Hello? Hi, may I speak to Robin? She's not here. Can I take a message? Tell her the guy from the party called and he liked what he saw. I left my number and went back to work. I then wondered if I had left my number for some chick that wasn't the brunette. I might have been baited into dating the skankiest 304 on campus or the ugliest trans around for all I knew. That evening, as I was settling in to watch the Bronco game I had taped earlier, my phone rang. I picked it up without even looking to see who was calling. Yeah, I don't know your name, but I've seen your package, said a moderately gruff but feminine voice. I was thinking my number had been given to a, well, should I just call you a mo? Dick will work just fine. Robin, is it? Yes, it's Robin. Sorry, my voice is hoarse from yelling at the game yesterday. Yelling at the game or something else? Would you like to meet me at Frankie's and in, say, an hour? I'd like to see your face better and show you I'm not part of a prank where people are really giving numbers as a joke. Sure, I'll be there in an hour. I'll be in a Shannon Sharp jersey and jeans. Okay, that's number 13 for the Chargers, right? No, number 84 for the Broncos. Tell me what you'll be wearing, it might be easier. She described in great detail what she'd be wearing, and 45 minutes later, I was perched in Frankie's cafe watching the door. I wasn't wearing the jersey just in case I had to slip out if a Dior-wearing dude came through the door. 20 minutes later, I saw her walk in. She was wearing exactly what she said she'd be wearing and looking quite hot. As she scanned the room, I felt like a schmuck for not wearing the jersey. I stood and waved at her, and she headed my way with a bemused look. Two or three guys stopped her on her way, but she quickly greeted and dismissed each one. Funny-looking Broncos jersey, Jack. Afraid of a switcheroo being pulled on you? Honestly, I wanted to make an escape if you turned out to be not as advertised. I guess I can't really blame you there. We drank coffee and ate pie until closing time and then said our goodbyes. I dated her for at least a month before we got intimate. On the Saturday night that I knew I was going to make my move, I called Bruce to tell him I was getting serious with a girl. He told me to make sure our feelings were true before I set her up for heartache. I chuckled out loud as I recalled his words to me. Funny, ten years later, she'd break my heart because of him. I realized I had chuckled out loud when I looked up and saw Robin and Dr. Landers looking at me like I had just dumped fruit salad on the floor. Do you find amusement in Robin's pain, Mr. Erickson? More like amusement in my own pain. I do believe I owe Gary Wayne a much overdue apology. Robin looked puzzled at the mention of Gary. She and he had dated once, but she didn't do anything with him. She had hooked up with Justin Laurie, the guy she was with at the party. Two days after their date, rumor was that Gary just didn't have a big enough meet for her. Now, why ever would you owe him an apology? asked the puzzled Robin. Well, it appears I might have punched him in the mouth for telling the truth. What truth would that be, Mr. Erickson? He told a buddy of mine that Robin should be nicknamed Big Bird because she was always seeking out a bigger limb to sit on. I don't understand, Mr. Erickson. She's a size queen, Miss Landers. 
Her face got a nice, angry red blush when I called her that. Robin just looked stricken. She dumped Gary because he had a small, weenie. Then she took one look at mine and dumped Justin. Now she's found out my ex-best friend has an even larger, meat and jumped to him. It's just stupid and filthy. If you say it's just intimate, I'll leave now, do my time in jail for contempt, and then move to Afghanistan where they treat adulterous witches with medieval methods. Robin and Dr. Landers were both shocked. Dr. Landers appeared to collect herself. Now, Robin, you'll have to realize that Neanderthal thinking doesn't comprehend multiple intimate partners in a happy marriage. What the hell are you yammering about, Mr. Erickson? It seems that many happily married couples enjoy multiple partners. Many husbands who realize they are not enough for their wives have no issue with sharing her with another man. Some even derive unparalleled pleasure from watching their mate get pleasured by a better specimen. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'd seen videos and read stories online about so-called cucks, men who ended up sleeping on the sidelines while their partners were with others. There isn't enough substance in the world to make me accept this kind of arrangement. It'd be a cold day in hell before I'd watch my spouse with someone else. I'd rather walk away than ever consider this kind of humiliation. Now, Jack, don't you think you owe it to yourself and your marriage to be more open-minded? No one said you had to watch or clean up afterward, although you could if you wanted. Yeah, Jack, that would be so exciting. I could even take care of you afterward. No way. You think I'd want Bruce's leftovers? I suppose you'll soon suggest I wear pink panties while you and Bruce are together and sleep in a cage at the foot of the bed. Oh no, Jack, we'd let you sleep in your own bed. I'm leaving, I said, my frustration clear. I was sure the receptionist was ready to call for help. No, Mr. Erickson, if you're open to other ideas, you might still save your marriage. Don't you get it? I don't want to save it. I want out. I want to find someone who believes in the vow to forsake all others. No, Jack, you are my husband, and I won't allow you to be with anyone else. Oh, it's fine for you to seek out more meat but not fine for me to find a new hole? Screw you. If you think I'm going to sit back and support you while Bruce screws around, you have a screw loose. I'm done. I'm out of here. I stood up. Mr. Erickson, you were ordered to attend these sessions, and failure to do so will get you thrown in jail for contempt of court. I've been here an hour and I don't need to be here any longer. I looked Dr. Landers straight in the eye. Go ahead and tell the black-robed witch everything I said in here. Tell her how uncooperative I've been. I don't give a flying rat's what she does to me. It'll be a cold day in hell before I ever get within ten feet of that skank again, I said, pointing at Robin. I'll also be talking to my lawyers about getting your license pulled, you psychotic piece of. Walking out of that building, I felt better than I had since this whole ordeal started. I got in my truck and drove straight to Bert's office. He got that old look on his face the moment he saw me. Please tell me you didn't kill anyone. I'd have loved to, but I didn't. I probably said some words they didn't like, but other than that. I proceeded to tell him about the session. I told him about the rehearsed feeling I had gotten from the whole scene. I told him about the counselor's attitude towards me. Jack, you're not the first to complain about this. I don't know what it is, but any complaint seems to get swept under the rug. I would have warned you, but I'd likely get hit with threats of tampering charges. I'm not going back. That fat, bubble but Jabba the Hutt can jail me if she wants, but I'm not sitting through three more hours of this. Bert told me he'd have David Crosby make a few calls. Stay out of trouble, Jack. We'll get this over sooner rather than later. I went home and wanted a few stiff drinks. I wanted to get wasted, but there just happened to be a red mark on the calendar for the day. I had three beers, though, since it was still early afternoon and I wouldn't be back on duty until after 7 o'clock. So I had my dinner and beers and settled in to watch TV. I must have looked like a champ drinking beer and watching Jerry Springer and pro wrestling. I finished my third beer about the time the ball game came on. In the middle of the sixth inning, the thunder started. I walked out onto the porch and saw the heavy black clouds moving over the downtown area. By the sudden chill in the air, I knew we were getting one of those summer hailstorms. The look of the clouds told me that Stonemore might have roofing crews working until Thanksgiving or later. 
two storms earlier in the summer had hit the north side particularly hard, promising to keep roofing contractors busy until at least early October. So, as the storm raged on outside and reports of power outages hit the TV, I prepared to work all night. My own neighborhood got some large hail, but a few calls to friends and agencies confirmed golf ball and baseball-sized hail in the Midtown area. Inevitably, the call came. But I didn't spend the night cleaning up from the hail. I, and about half of the crew that night, were in dump trucks hauling sand and road base to the river dike. It seems that it had been raining hard every afternoon for the past week in the mountains. That, and what was dropped by this evening's storm, brought the river up fast and it was threatening two earthen dikes and the Lime Road Bridge. By four in the morning, the Army Corps of Engineers claimed the dike was safe and the county had a good handle on the bridge. They set about deciding what repairs would be needed when the ground dried up some. My crew headed out to see where we could be useful. I spent another three hours hauling sand and dirt washed into roadways by the storm away to dry. At nine Friday morning, I pulled into my driveway, knowing that this time I would not be catching my wife riding Bruce's, well, mainly because I had no wife and I no longer cared whose, she rode. I was strumming pretty well on a mix of coffee and energy drinks, but I figured a nice shot of Jadermeister should help me sleep with little or no problems. So, I finished my bottle off and lay down on my couch to watch TV. The next thing I knew, someone was knocking on my door and it was dark outside. The clock on my phone told me it was almost 11 o'clock. I looked out onto my porch to see Brenda McBain standing there. What does she want? I wondered out loud. I turned on the porch light and opened the door. I'm sorry to bother you, Jack, but there's something I think you need to see. It might help you with your divorce problem. I stood there for a minute, trying to comprehend what she could possibly show me that would help with my ordeal. It didn't help that she looked damned hot. She was wearing a tight little pair of shorts, a light yellow halter, and for the first time, I noticed that her eyes were a beautiful shade of gray. She said something that I didn't catch and then turned and headed for her driveway. Even with my brain on autopilot, I was able to discern that she wanted me to follow her. She opened her car door, and I went to the passenger side and got in. As she drove in silence, I caught myself constantly staring at the shape of her marvelous legs. I had thought that Robin and Cheryl had some nice gams, but they had chicken legs compared to Brenda. I think she caught me staring a time or two because her smile would widen. I caught myself staring at her body almost inappropriately several times. In profile, her face wasn't as bad as it seemed. Brenda drove me to a group of abandoned buildings downtown. The city had bought all of the buildings in hopes of making revenue from developers that had been buying property in the area about 12 years ago. The funny thing was that every time someone made a bid on these properties, the board that controlled sales of city property nixed the deal. This board was made up of five trustees, and all five had to vote for a sale to be completed. Their votes were by secret ballot, so nobody knew who nixed the deals. It had cost the city a great deal in upkeep and security to keep vagrants out. Two years ago, they had a 10-foot chain-link fence installed to keep people out. We parked in the old power plant parking lot which seemed to have more cars parked in it than there should be. Brenda, what are we doing here? We could get into huge trouble if we're caught. Come on, Jack. You'll see in a few. I'm positive this will help you in a big way. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out how getting arrested for trespassing would help me with a divorce that seemed to be going sideways, but I followed Brenda anyway. She came to a spot in the fence and walked through. I got to the fence and saw that it had been cut. I was about to ask Brenda who had cut it when I saw she was 30 feet away, approaching a basement window of the old King James Hotel. I caught up to her, and she motioned me to the window. She pointed to a spot where I could see light coming out of the window. What the hell? I knew the power had been cut to the building years ago, yet there was light. I looked through and realized why Brenda had brought me here. As I gasped in surprise and took in the scene, Brenda handed me her camcorder. On the way home, Brenda explained to me how she had discovered the goings-on at the hotel. Tommy and I were spying on Bruce and Robin one evening when he mentioned that place to her. So on the following Friday night, we followed him and Robin there. I was surprised that Cheryl didn't go. So that was Friday night choir practice, huh? Brenda looked over at me as if she was embarrassed that I had discovered another of my wife's secrets. 
Don't worry, Brenda. I'll keep you and Tommy out of everything. My beef is with the others. You know, the only reason Tommy and I screw around is that we are both too ugly for anyone else to want to have intimate with us. Where in the hell did that come from? I wondered to myself. I knew I had never questioned their activities. Oh, that can't be true. I bet there are countless guys who would kill to be with you. Maybe some guys who'd use me, but none want to be seen in public with me. I've had three boyfriends who would date some prudes and then want to meet me in secret afterwards. I hear the jokes, Jack. They call me Butterface, you know, killer body, Butterface, and they call me a three-bagger, one bag on my head, one on his in case mine falls off, and one by the door for anyone who might accidentally walk in. I'm good enough to have intimate in the dark and in secret, but not to be dated or shown off in public. Come on, Brenda, it can't be all that bad. If I was a guy your age, I'd be all over you. I felt like a true a-hole for lying to her, but she was on the verge of tears and she had just helped me out big time. You have indeed helped me out tremendously, and I'd like to take you out to dinner tomorrow evening. Get all dolled up and I'll pick you up at 7 o'clock. Okay, you don't have to give me pity, Jack. Besides, I'm going to Denver tomorrow morning and won't be back until Sunday evening. It's not pity. And if you want, I'll take a rain check on the dinner. She agreed to the rain check, and I got out of the car and went inside. I had the a-holes where I wanted them. In the morning, I'd make a few phone calls. By Thursday, everything was in place. I had called Bert first. Well, I have to warn you that what you're doing is considered extortion. I do think it will work. Damn, no wonder that witch always orders the things she does. My next call went to Mike Starr. Mike and I had been buddies in high school, and now he was an investigative reporter for the local TV news. I gave him copies of the video and all of the pertinent details. He had heard rumors about this before and told me they also did it on Wednesday nights sometimes. He was going to stake out the hotel and bust them live on TV. On Monday morning, I went into the head of the city maintenance department's office with a proposal that would achieve two things. One, I would solve a storage problem we had and all it would cost the city would be some fences, and second, it would put access to the hotel out of reach for those I wanted to make suffer. He liked the plan. Since the city already owned the property, all the maintenance department had to do was put a request in with the zoning office. The board that controlled the sale of city property would never be involved since we were only reappropriating land, not selling it. Since the fences wouldn't cost more than $150,000, we wouldn't need to submit a budget request. As I was walking out of his office, he told me he was recommending me for a promotion. You saved us at least half a million dollars if we get this done, and I am positive that we will. Great thinking, Jack. I need more thinkers on my staff. By Wednesday morning, we had all of our approvals in line, including all the permits we'd need. I was put in charge of overseeing the move and all of the upgrades needed for the property. A 10-man crew was dedicated to my task, and I knew the project would be complete within three weeks. Thursday morning, we began moving fencing material to the old power plant parking lot. We were also going to use a large chunk of land behind the hotel for snowplow storage and a brand new sand depot. I left work at noon because I had counseling with Dr. Landers at 1 o'clock. At 12.30, I walked into the reception room of Dr. Landers' office. The receptionist threw me a dirty look and called into her boss's office. Five minutes later, I was told to go on in, and the door buzzed. Dr. Landers looked so smug that it made it all the more enjoyable for me. Mr. Erickson, I have to say I am a bit surprised to see you here at all, let alone early. I'm glad we can have a few minutes to do some one-on-one -on -one before the session starts. One-on-one -on -one would be a new concept, eh? Excuse me, Mr. Erickson? I just came in today to tell you that I won't be attending the sham anymore, nor will I pay for it. She looked miffed and then got one of those holier-than-thou smiles on her face. Judge Kagan ordered your attendance, Mr. Erickson. You'll go. Screw you. Eat my, and choke on the largest piece. I won't be going anywhere. Mr. Erickson, you really should watch your mouth. You're going to call your partner Kagan and tell her the gig is up. I know about your little swingers club in the basement of the King James, and pretty soon my buddy Mike Starr is going to know about it too. 
I'm sure various legal and ethical enforcement agencies will be really curious to know why a family court judge and a family slash marriage counselor run an intimate club. All the while, cheating. There's no such club. Stupid witch, don't try to tell me there isn't a club. I saw you. I saw them. I saw the elk head wearing a fireman's hat and condoms on its antlers. Her face got paler and paler as I ranted on. I didn't bother to tell her that Mike Starr already knew about their club, nor that I had provided him with video proof. He also knew who kept blocking the sale of the properties. I wasn't sure when Mike was going to blow the lid off this case, but I knew it was coming. Judge Kagan and her husband likely stood to lose the most. He worked in the DA's office, and Stonewall DA Jim Morrison was always quick to rid his office of anyone who might cause him embarrassment. I turned at the door and looked at a more sullen and dejected Dr. Landers. Screw you. Twenty minutes later, Robin was with Dr. Landers. Let's look at the story from her side. I was somewhat apprehensive when the door to Dr. Landers' office buzzed ten minutes after my session with my husband Jack was supposed to begin. Bruce and my attorney, Justin Bieber, both assured me that Dr. Landers and Judge Kagan would either convince Jack to be more open-minded toward my situation or make the process so long and drawn out that he'd eventually give up and let things be. I wore a shorter skirt than I did for our first session. I opted not to wear hose this time either. My hair was styled just like he liked, and I wore the perfume he bought me for our anniversary last year. Dr. Landers looked absolutely stricken when I walked in. I noticed Jack was not there and assumed that Abby had suffered some family tragedy and had been dismissed already. I was upset that I wouldn't get to see him today, no matter how black his hate for me was. My love was still strong. I was not allowed to walk down either side of our street or be on the back balcony while Jack was home. Is Jack risking jail just to avoid the session? I asked her. I knew she didn't like the macho man type of guys like Jack, and with Jack's boisterous attitude and foul mouth, she had more trouble dealing with him than many other men. There's no session today, Robin. I'll call and let you know the situation when I have more information. She pressed a button, and the door buzzed open. I glanced back at the once confident woman, wondering what could have shaken her so much. I drove to the church to meet Bruce. With some extra time on my hands, I found myself thinking about the gathering planned for the next night and how it would be different from anything I'd experienced before. Bruce and I had grown closer, and I couldn't help but wonder what Jack would think if he were more open-minded and willing to join us. The idea of us all being together seemed to fill my thoughts as I stepped out of the car, catching the scent of my own perfume in the cool evening air. Bruce was on the phone when I went in. He looked to be in a foul mood, but then again, he'd been in a foul mood since Jack found out about us. The look he gave me as I entered his office let me know I'd have to wait to scratch my itch. That's Terry. There will be no club meeting tonight. It seems Jack found out about it all and has threatened to call his buddy Mike Starr in on the whole thing. I don't know how he found out, but now he can embarrass a whole lot of people. I'm regretting ever hooking up with you, Robin. I swear, your holes are not worth all this trouble. I was stunned. A few months ago, he wanted me over every day of the week. He told me I was far better than Cheryl and more fun as well. Now, with a little pushback from Jack, I was suddenly out of favor. Just after dinner that night, my attorney called. He told me we'd been moved up, and we had a hearing in the morning. He said the only time he'd ever seen a judge move a hearing up like this was when the filing party had dropped their petition for divorce. I asked if it could be a contempt of court hearing for Jack. Justin said he seriously doubted that. If Jack was being called before the judge, we wouldn't have been ordered in. He told me to sleep well and that he had good feelings for tomorrow. Bruce seemed to cheer up a bit at my news. Perhaps someone had convinced him to cooperate and stay quiet. There were influential people involved who could apply pressure. Jack might have had courage, but he lacked the influence. The night went well. Bruce, Cheryl, and I all enjoyed ourselves. By 10 o'clock the next morning, I was in Judge Kagan's courtroom. Jack's attorney and another man were present, but Jack was absent. I asked Justin if Jack's absence would cause him any trouble. Not likely. He might be dealing with things elsewhere. What's puzzling is why Graham Nash is here. He hasn't been in a courtroom for six years. Something's definitely up. Judge Kagan entered and called the court to order. 
Jack's attorney and Mr. Nash asked to approach. Justin went up as well, and the four stood talking at the bench for at least 20 minutes. Justin looked troubled when he returned to my table, but I didn't get a chance to ask him before the judge banged her gavel and pronounced that in 90 days, the marriage of Jack and Robin Erickson would be dissolved. She then told me that I would receive no alimony or support from Jack. He was being ordered to turn over 25% of his retirement to me as well as 40% of our liquid assets, which meant cash. According to Justin, Judge Kagan had decided to grant Mr. Erickson's petition for divorce. The next thing I knew, I was being helped to a seat by an EMT. Ma'am, can you tell me how many fingers I am holding up? Within three weeks, everything had gone to hell. The TV news did a piece about the swingers club and all of those involved. Judge Kagan was removed from the bench, and the government was investigating with a high probability that she'd be brought up on charges. Her husband was fired immediately and brought up on charges stemming from his involvement with a drug-running scheme uncovered during the scandal. Justin Bieber was disbarred because he was discovered to have had intimate with a few of his male clients and had thrown cases for Judge Kagan. He was also involved in the drug ring that had been busted in one of the city high schools. Dr. Landers was ordered to repay 30 clients that Judge Kagan had referred to her. She was found in her bathtub with her wrists slit. Her husband was discovered on the toilet next to her with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Bruce was asked to step down from his ministry, and his severance barely covered his moving expenses. Cheryl filed for divorce after discovering Bruce in a compromising situation involving Jerry Springer and Brenda McBain. She cited this incident as part of her reason for leaving, but mainly she was exhausted by his actions leading to trouble and embarrassment. Bruce blamed me for his problems and said he wouldn't be taking me with him. I moved into a small apartment with Cheryl while we got things sorted. I used most of the money I received from Jack to set up our utilities and to help Cheryl hire an attorney. Bruce tried to hire a high-profile legal team but ended up with a less experienced lawyer he found in the one ads. Cheryl managed to secure a favorable outcome for herself. Last I heard, Bruce was in Iowa, preaching at a non-denominational church. I got a job with an accounting firm after my divorce was finalized. Cheryl worked for a contractor and was dating one of his employees. I chose to focus on myself and didn't pursue any new relationships. I wanted Jack every once in a while. I'd walk past our old street and see the for sale sign in the yard. Two weeks ago, I saw a sold sign on top. I was distraught and went to buy some comfort food, mainly haagen and Chips Ahoy. As I was passing the frozen dinner section on my way to the ice cream, I saw Jack. He was buying a frozen pizza. Before I knew what I was doing, I was groveling before him in the store. I don't remember exactly what I said, but when I stopped to take a breath and wipe my eyes, Jack looked embarrassed and a small crowd had gathered. He just smiled at me and pointed to his butt and said, eat my ass and die, and walked away. Las Vegas, Nevada, four years later. Jack was in Las Vegas now. Back with Jack, I pulled my truck into the driveway and looked at my lawn. I needed to mow it, but I would wait until Saturday morning. I'd get up at 6 o'clock and mow before the temperature hit 100. I walked inside, and my wife threw her arms around me and gave me a deep, passionate kiss. Hi, baby. Did you make sure the tourists and pensioners wouldn't sneak an extra nickel or two from the huge conglomerate corporations? My job as a slot machine technician never failed to bring out my wife's peace of mind, and when you graduate with honors next month, you're going to be among the faceless drones slaving for the man, just like me. At least until you knock me up, baby. She kissed me again. Well, my sexy man, I sure am glad you're home. So, are you studying with the girls tonight, doll? Yes, but I'll have to watch Samantha around you, Jack. She just can't seem to keep her eyes off your butt. I used to have a neighbor girl like that. She was always staring at my butt, especially when you'd mow the lawn. I still can't believe Robin was stupid enough to screw Mr. Harris. Oh well, her loss, my gain. Yes indeed, Brenda. I guess I'll go get us a pizza or three. I know how you college girls chow down. She kissed me as I headed back out the door. Brenda and I had been married for three years now. I got to Vegas about three days after I left Stonemore. I know some folks would think I'm a total jerk for leaving Robin in the motel and Casper the way I did, but there was no way I was ever going to trust that witch again. 
She had been asleep about 10 minutes when I slipped out and paid for the use of the room. I didn't know how long it would take for her to get someone to come get her, so I bought her three days' time. Thanks to NAS and NOO, I made it to Utah before sunup. Two days later, I was pulling into Las Vegas. Within a week, I had a job and a place to stay. I used my revenue from the sale of my house and my retirement fund to buy a house. Two weeks later, as planned, Brenda showed up. She had enrolled at UNLV at the end of her senior year in high school. During the weeks I was waiting for my house to sell and my divorce to become final, I spent a lot of time with Brenda. It started with her coming by to make sure I wasn't drinking too much. She'd bring food, and we'd eat together. We'd watch movies together on most weeknights and go places on the weekends. The more I got to know her, the more I liked her, and I discovered I wasn't ashamed to be seen in public with her. When I told her about Robin begging me to take her back in the store, she got teary-eyed and was ready to bawl. Hey, I have no plans whatsoever of going back to her, Brenda. I'm falling for you. I have a plan if you think you can stand to be with an old man like me. The rest of the sentence was swallowed by her kiss before I could get it all out. That night, after three rounds, the first fever and hot, the latter two more relaxed and loving, I finished laying out my plan to her. I expected Tom and Jerry to throw a fit, but it was just the opposite. Jack, you have always been a crude and rough individual, but I can't imagine our daughter in better hands, Tom told me one afternoon in his garage. I know you'll treat her right and make her happy. Hell, she's been in love with you since the day you and that other one moved in. Jerry better not have any inbreeding ideas with the son-in-law, I thought to myself. I also wondered if my future brother-in-law would be jealous. A year after we got to Las Vegas, Brenda made friends with a cosmetology student who taught her a new way of doing her makeup so that her positive aspects were highlighted, her words, not mine. I do have to say it was a night and day difference. Brenda changed her hairstyle and became a rather attractive woman. We got married right after her freshman year. I told her that if she met a guy her age, she was more than welcome to try. She didn't speak to me for almost a week. You silly, stupid a-hole, she said when she finally started speaking to me again. Since I was a teenage girl, I have only had eyes for one man. I watched as the wrong woman threw you away, and now I'll be damned if I'll ever let you go. I do talk to people back home once in a while. Of course, Tom and Jerry keep us up to date. Cheryl ended up married to some tile guy. They had a kid last I heard and moved to California. Robin made it back to Stonewall two years after I stranded her in Wyoming. It seems she hooked up with a rancher there and married him. He kicked her out a year later when he caught her running a train with three of his ranch hands. The pimple-faced kid behind the counter just told me my pizzas are ready. If I can get them home quickly enough, Brenda will likely jump my bones before her study group shows up. Me, I'll retire to my den and watch the Rockies on my MLB season pass on my satellite. From one risky woman to another, my life is as good as it gets. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.